Okay, folks, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to everyone online. Welcome to everyone in person. Um, very quickly, as we talk through the lavender, it's going to be ideals. When we get to full sun, when we get to well-drained soil, as we talk about kind of how to plan it out, how to space it out, those type of things are all kind of all the ideal of this is the best case scenario. So what you're going to do with all that information is kind of fit it into your gardening scenario. So what, what does that mean? <clears throat> well, let's take full sun because that's a pretty good one to start with being that, you know, it's going to be varied, especially in a class this size. So full sun is the sun is up. My plant is growing. And between my plant and the sun is nothing. The sun is beating down on my plant. There's no buildings in the way. It's not in a container on the east side of the house or something like that. So full sun means just that, just full sun. With that in mind, lavender plants, herb plants in general, vegetable plants, your flowers, they all love full sun. More sun, more growth, more fruit, more blooms, more foliage, all the rest of it as well. So any of that kind of, any of that variance will affect how quickly your plant grows uh, how much it blooms. It's really not going to affect the scent because a small plant that's grown in less sun is still going to grow, but it's not going to be as thick and as full and bloom as much, but it's still going to smell the same. So if we revert real quick to like a basil, it's still going to taste right. It's just not going to grow as much. But let's stay to lavender. So we planted, um, we have soft pack clay, pretty typical of Virginia. You can dig it with a shovel but you can't really dig it with your hand kind of thing. So we planted lavender in that soil. <clears throat> and what I need to do is um, be mindful that the roots don't like that. They need drainage. So as far as, you know, kind of planting in the ground, lavender is better to be either kind of mounded up or in a, in a raised bed or something like that. But we'll get to that in just a second. Um, <clears throat> the, the lavender with the full sun. So if you plant it in the ground, you know, and it has six hours or less, that's where it gets a little questionable. So is it going to grow? Is it not? That's kind of where six hours or less, that's on the border. So if that's where you're at, we'll, we'll cover that in just a second. But uh, let's say six to eight or nine hours, you're going to have a plant that's nice and, and bushy and grow and bloom. If you have a plant that's nine to 12 to longer in the sun, you know, that spot in your yard that hardly grows weeds. That's the spot lavender wants to be. It loves baking. It loves out there being stressed, so to speak. Very, very little water. That's really what it's after as far as the how it grows and the conditions that it likes. So full baking sun, um, and then we'll get to the drainage in just a, in just a moment. But as far as the, the sunlight, it's the most sun you can give it, the better off the plant's going to grow, the thicker it's going to be. So back to that six to nine, the nine and above hours of sunlight, the more sun, the thicker, the fuller, the more blooms, the quicker it will reach that mature height. So the full maturity for a French lavender is about five to, well, five to five and a half feet around. An English, which is, I'll get to that in a moment on your handout, an English is about three to three and a half feet around. So the English are just a smaller plant by nature. So on your handout, up towards the top there, where it says <clears throat> Lavendula angustifolia, those are English lavender varieties. So you've got the Gene Davis, you've got the Hidcote, those are English lavenders. On the back of the tag uh, on a lavender, you'll see Lavendula angustifolia Hidcote. So lavender is your larger umbrella of lavender. Intermediate uh, angustifolia. We've got dentata. There's a whole bunch of them. Those are kind of your subcategories. And then within those subcategories, there's your specific names of Hidcote, Munstead, Dutch, Provence, Grosso, Fat Spike, and all the rest of it. Why Latin helps. 
And this is about as far as your brain has to stretch mm -hmm. in foreign languages this morning. Why the Latin name helps is on the East Coast, it can be called Bob's Best. On the West Coast, it can be called Frank's Best. You read it in a magazine. It's not so much the exact name. Think of the qualities that you like. Try to find the Latin name of it, and that'll tell you the category of plant that it comes from, whether it be in English, whether it be a French, so forth. And then the distinct differences between, let's say, a head coat super blue and a head coat big blue are pretty much going to be negligible. So as long as you find the head coat, then you're good kind of thing. So, again, I'll leave that with you. If you've got your heart set on finding exactly what's in the magazine, enjoy that journey. Um, with the with the different varieties. So English is the traditional style lavender. All of your English are grandma had lavender, lavender back in the day. The English lavender is what those have come from in the sense of they are the original scent, original smell. If you think of uh, Yardley soap, that really strong, sweet lavender smell, that's kind of that English lavender smell. The um, French lavender, which is also called uh, hybrids, that's the intermediates on your hand out there. So you've got Lavendula, Intermedia, Dutch Provence, White Provence. Those are your large hybrid lavenders. So they get anywhere from five to five and a half feet around. They grow very quickly versus an English lavender that gets about three to three and a half feet around. Feet across, yep. Around, yep. Across, left to right, side to side. Um, and about two foot tall without the blooms, like just the foliage. So <clears throat> that, that kind of size, that English size, that three to three and a half feet, that's its full maturity height under excellent conditions. On the hybrids, so your uh, uh, Grosso lavender, your uh, Provence lavender, they're also known as the French lavenders. They get fairly large, that five to five and a half feet. <clears throat> so little plant starts out at a few inches. First year kind of quadruples in size, second year, double to triple the size of that, and then the last year, it tops out at that mature size. With that in mind, we have um, plants across the road there that aren't in the excellent like drainage that you want. They have taken three years, which is what you the time length for full maturity. They're only at about four feet. But again, that's kind of bigger than the English are that are over there. The English lavenders over in the field are about two and a half to three feet. So they're on the smaller side because it's not as well drained. And again, they're not growing kind of to their full potential. But they still bloom, still smell good, and all the rest of it. As a side note, to give you an idea, over in the field that we have, it's a small field. It's just under 200 plants on a good year we'll lose about 15% of those. On a bad year, we'll lose about half of them. So lavender in Virginia doesn't like high humidity. It doesn't like clay soil. And it doesn't like up and down winters. And that's what you call the trifecta, right? We have, we have all three of those. So with that in mind, full sun is really going to serve you very well. Well-drained soil which is the uh, second point on your hand out there. It's a good drainage. They love dry feet. So their roots, they love to be dry. When you plant your plant, you water it in very well and thoroughly, making sure that around the actual plant itself is the water, not kind of all around here where the roots aren't yet. So water your plant in really well. Let it get dry to the point of bending over and wilting and the leaves getting skinnier. You dig down a couple inches and make sure it's dry all the way down. And then as the plant dries out, it's going to want to find more water. So when it does that, it's obviously growing you a healthier plant. If your plant always sits in water and doesn't need to go to the grocery store to get water or toilet paper, depending on what's going on, the the, the plant itself isn't really exercised well. It always has water next to it. It just sits there. It doesn't really grow per se. If you make it dry out though, and really think that it's not 
going to get any more water. It's going to search out and grow you a healthier plant. That's container or ground. We'll get to containers, lavender growing in containers in just a little bit. But let's kind of talk through the, the larger concerns with the full sun and the well-drained soil. <clears throat> we often get asked about amending. What do I do to amend my area to grow lavender? So lavender being that it's three and a half feet above the soil to five feet above the soil. And just by the way, too, folks, lavender, 300 pounds of foliage gets distilled to give you one pound of lavender oil. So those large French lavenders, the hybrid lavenders that get close to twice the size as an English, that's your general use therapeutic um, aromatherapy kind of grade lavender oil. That, that's the difference between those two varieties significantly. The English and the hybrids or the English and the French lavenders really spec out at exactly the same growing conditions. Full sun, well-drained, they grow very nicely in Virginia. They're hardy to zone five, so there's no problems with, you know, dying because it's too cold. It really is more so for us the humidity, the up and down winters. That's why generally what we've found is the French will do better. When folks ask, I'm just starting out growing lavender, which variety should I get? We usually always recommend the fat spike, which is also called Grosso. Um, the Provence is another variety of the French or the hybrid lavenders. So both of those are very, very good starting points. The difference between the French, uh, sorry, the Provence and the Fat Spike is that the Fat Spike's a bit of a darker purple. Mm -hmm. The Provence is your true light kind of lavender colored bloom, whereas your Fat Spike is a bit of a darker purple. This one here is the Hidcoat Lavender. And that's about the deepest, darkest purple that you can get. So it kind of borders on blue. You know, there's blue hues to it versus straight up plum kind of purple color. But uh, head coats, probably the most revered for the blooms, being that they're their darkest purple. That's an English lavender. So it smells fantastic as well. It has that sweet floral aroma. Um, to give you an idea, between the English and the hybrid or the French lavenders, the English here, you're only gonna be able to see the size difference. It'll grow slower. They both look very similar. They both bloom around the same time. The English is a little bit earlier, kind of early June, whereas the hybrids bloom in mid June. So not a whole lot of difference between the two. And when you smell them, make sure you rub the foliage and you have a smell. The English is just going to be just a touch stronger and sweeter. But the French, the hybrid lavender, smells fantastic. It's not that's lacking. You know, you're giving up a little bit to grow an easier plant, per se. And I don't want to be confused or confusing, sorry, on how the difference between the two. The hybrid lavender doesn't always perform better for people. So if you're experimenting, Maybe get one of each, plant them, see what works for you. We have folks that will only buy English lavender. We have other folks that only buy the French and some that buy both. So um, to pick either one of them, I don't think you're going to lose out greatly. It's just when we're asked, the hybrid or that French lavender really is does seem to us to be the easier one to grow. And I think really it comes down to the fact that because it gets so big, versus the other one at half the size, as it grows, it more, it runs instead of kind of jogs along. So obviously stopping something running is harder than stopping something jogging. So bugs, um, soil conditions, less sunlight. Again, if those are variances of concern, you're going to want to go off, go with the uh, French or the hybrid variety for sure with that. The, um, <clears throat> The, the good drainage, so soil amending, sorry. So, we, yeah, we often get asked the question of soil amending. So being that they get that big, to me it seems unfair to say go ahead and hire an excavator and amend three mm -hmm. feet down because unless you amend three feet down, all you're really doing is buying yourself some time. Let's say you dig four inches down. Well, the plant will happily continue on through that nice four inches that you've created for it, but when it hits that clay, it's going to do the same thing as if it hit the clay four inches earlier. So with that in mind, 
usually I don't kind of recommend to you. You can if you want. It's just you're really only buying at time when you amend down like that. It's either going to work or it's not. I mean, I don't know about you. I'm a naturally lazy person. If I don't get if I don't get promised the result, I'm really not going to do all that sweating and backbreaking and digging and everything. So um, it really is just better to kind of mound dirt up, raise that plant up, and get the crown drained. So plant it nice and high. When you plant it, bring the dirt up to the edge, but make sure the crown of the plant is at the top. So let me pop this out. <clears throat> Okay, so what I mean by that is the crown of your plant, where it actually has the stem kind of coming out the ground, make sure this point right at the end of my pointer finger here is the highest point. So plant it, bring the soil up to it, but not over top of it, and not you know too high where the roots are exposed to the air. I know it's a fine line. It's not going to take you that much time to get it straight. So bring it up, and then as you plant it, kind of brush that top dirt away and then make sure that it drains from that crown and the crown is nice and dry. <clears throat> Over in the field, we have six 180-foot rows. Sand is an excellent soil amendment for your lavender, but make sure it's big, coarse grain sand really big, not the fine play sand or paver sand. The bigger the course of the grain, the happier and healthier the plants are going to be. Now, to give you the background though, those rows, we priced out an inch of sand in that row to amend. It was $1,000. That's just for the sand. Um, I didn't think I'd get many volunteers to come out and help me shovel, you know, a few tons of sand through those rows. We went ahead and we did not do that. It's done fine. Again, if you're amending, you either go big or you don't kind of thing. So with that in mind, it's more so just we mounted those rows up. We put some fabric over top to keep the weeds down, which you don't have to do. Um, and with that in mind, they've turned out just how they would have with the sand, I think, pretty much easily as well. So uh, as far as amending goes, it really is just mounded up. Keep that foliage dry. They're very susceptible to leaf funguses. So that's why you want that crown of the plant to be dry. Now, what we did do was put a shovel load of nice coarse gravel underneath the root ball as we planted it. So at the very least, the crown of the root ball, kind of the beginning of the plant, the roots were as dry as possible to be kept in there. So that's what we ended up choosing to spend a little bit of money on. But again, kind of the cost benefit is more so personal. Uh, with, with what you're doing. Okay, so we have a question. Will la lavender smother the weeds? Uh, that would be nice because uh, we'd have a lot more lavender going on. Uh, as far as as it grows and gets bigger, though, yes, there is some kind of shading effect to the plant because as it gets bigger, it doesn't more so grow upright. It grows out. So it's more of a ground kind of shrub that you're not going to get weeds necessarily in there to be able to survive. But as far as around as it's growing, because again, when you plant it, getting that big, it's going to kind of grow that size. So you're likely going to have kind of empty space around that. So that's more so why we put the fabric down for the weed control was as it grows that we're not having to weed it all the time around there. So. Hopefully that answers your question, Bill. If not, shoot another one back. <clears throat> um, so good drainage. Let's talk about containers now while we're on the topic. So containers, no lavender likes a container. So there's the bad news. The good news is um, as long as you keep ahead of it so that it doesn't know it's in a container and doesn't become pot bound, like really, really pot bound, as long as you keep ahead of it, you should be fine. The problem with that, though, is this hybrid, or the French lavender, gets five feet in three years. So it's going to grow pretty quickly. So with a container, the slower you step it up, the, idea, the, the better off and happier the plant's going to be. And what I mean by that is this is a four-inch pot. You would go to a six-inch, let it regrow into that, then go to an eight-inch. 
So the slower you step it up, the healthier the plant's going to be because it's not going to get overwhelmed. It's not going to sit in dirt that's wet that the roots aren't using and that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> with that in mind, we've got better varieties. Some of the English varieties are a lot smaller of a plant. Their mature height uh, and size is about 14 to 18 inches around. Uh, those we'll have in the beginning of May. It's elegance pink, elegance purple, uh, and I think we got a white one this year as well. Uh, they're smaller plants, so again, they'll top out at about 14 to 18 inches. So that stepping up value increases for you because you're not having to do it as often and they're just not as much work. So um, if you want to treat it like an annual and plant one of the big ones in a container, it will most likely do very nice. Uh, just make sure the potting mix, so the soil that it's grown in, is nice and fluffy. We use a potting mix, which is very light and fluffy. You run your hand through it, it's very light, versus potting soils. Potting soils are cheaper, but they're heavier. They hold the water longer. So, again, not just for containers, but plant, like the plant in the ground or in a container. The quicker it goes from dry to wet and then dries back out again, to dry and then watered and then dry back out again, the quicker that that cycle happens, the healthier your plants are gonna be. Again, it goes back to that premise, if the plant is sitting in water for long extended periods of time, so think self-watering containers, think soil moist, you know, potting mixes, think really heavy dirt, the longer that they sit in water, the slower they're going to grow. So again, the drying out effect is more work for you but a much happier and healthier plant. Now, you know, folks here, you don't have to type your questions in. You can just ask, right? <laughs> okay, okay, so those two things, full sun, well-drained soil, the reason we spent so much time on those two things is that's about 80% of your success rate is bound up in those two items. So, again, <clears throat> all of the other little things we're going to talk about not that they're inconsequential by any means, but they're just nowhere near as important as the full sun and well-drained soil. Soil requirements. So we usually run around here a pH of about 5.5. They like a pH of 7.5. So anywhere between 6 and 8 is manageable. A 7.5 is the bullseye on the dartboard for you. So usually a bit of lime. And um, we sell the little test kits in the store. They're the old capsule. They're, you know, the easiest way to do it. You've got results instantly. Um, those will test your pH. They've also got included in the kit testing your NPK, your nutrient levels, which lavender doesn't like fertilizer, but we'll get to that in a little bit. But the pH is fairly important. We put this in here uh, third because of the other ones, it's just the unknown. It's the one that you don't know unless you test. If you want to plant your plant, kind of bring your dirt up, plant your plant and have at it. If it grows, wonderful, fantastic. If you have problems and you're not overwatering it, uh, a soil test kit is a good idea to test your pH just to see because the more acidic the soil is, the unhappier that lavender plant is going to be for sure. Which brings us to mulch. Unfortunately, lavender does not like mulch. Mulches are hardwoods, which will release acid into your soil, which again takes acidic soil to begin with that we have around here and makes it even more acidic. So no mulch on your lavender. You live in a homeowner development that has it and everyone spreads it and you have to have it and um, there's no option, then you can amend with lime test your pH as it breaks down maybe once a month, and that'll give you a nice curve that you can amend to and figure out what you need to do to combat that. But as far as the ideals, it would be no mulch. Um, the uh, way to amend around it is some mushroom compost. If you want, you don't have to do anything. Lavender does not like food. We'll cover the uh, fertilizer right now, being that we'll wrap it into this point here. So no fertilizer out in the ground for lavender ever. It does not like food. 
herb plants in general, lavender specifically, if you over fertilize it and pump it full of nutrients, it's going to grow you this gorgeous big full plant that doesn't smell as strong, that hardly blooms because it's pushed all of its energy into actually growing you the plant as opposed to more so kind of growing and setting the bloom and setting the scent and all of that kind of thing. So no fertilizer. Again, go back to that spot in your yard that hardly grows weeds because it's terrible soil with very, very little nutrients that gets no water, that gets no attention. That's where lavender wants to be. So <clears throat> on the um, on the fertilizer thing, again, with the soil requirements, it's more so just your pH that you want to know about. Okay. Um, climate, we've pretty much kind of already covered that. Cold temperatures, wind, snow, as long as they're provided good drainage. That Where it lists on your handout here under climate, uh, the lavender listocious. So that's another variety, another subset variety of lavender. That's your Spanish, and that's quite different. The smell is different. The bloom type. Uh, is different. It's more of a very thin stem with kind of a large bud head the size of the last little knuckle on your pinky finger. So it's this little stem with this last little knuckle of your pinky finger and it's got the little feathers or rabbit ears out the top. Um, a gorgeous bloom. The bloom detail, the little dots, it's got orange dots up one side, white dots on the next, yellow, orange, yellow, orange, kind of as you work your way around. The feathers that come out the top, the little rabbit ears, all different colors. The smell, however, is a pine sole lavender smell mixed together. I can't stand it. My aunt Nicole loves it. So, again, it's each to their own on that side. But it's really when you smell it, no one I've, no one I've heard will say, oh, that smells like lavender. It's kind of a mix of the two. And obviously, if you're after the dried blooms for your crafts, um, it doesn't have that type of that type of spike bloom that you're used to. Just a really short. Uh, this one here. So, what type is that? That's the head coat. That's the deepest, darkest purple. That's the English lavender. Um, that's actually freeze dried from the field. That's why it retains all of that color. That does work okay here. Yes, of all of them, that grows fine. The, the French, which is the Provence or the Grosso, that grows fine too. Grosso and Fat Spike, just to clear it up, they go by the they're the same plant. They go by two different names. So, <clears throat> if it wasn't as confusing, you wouldn't need me. So that's why we kind of keep it that way. Um, those those two again, those two subcategories, the English and the French, or the hybrids, the intermediates. The Angustifolias, the Intermediates, those two are the better ones to try in our area. If you're going to choose between the two, I would go with the Intermediates or the Hybrids, also known as the French Lavender. Those are the, the bigger plants, so they grow bigger. And that's really the only difference why we choose that one over the English is over the years, that's the one that's been a little bit more successful for people. <clears throat> that shouldn't discourage you from growing the English, though. If you want to start with one, start with the, the uh, French or the hybrid variety. If you can grow that and you're happy with the return on investment, go ahead and, and try in English. Um, fertilizer, covered that. Watering. So on the watering, just to be clear, to make sure I've wrapped up that point before we move on, when you water, water very thoroughly. Make sure you don't kind of tease water. You know, when dad would send me out to water the garden when I was younger, as long as the dirt was brown from a dry, I was good to go. That's not what you want to do. You want to make sure that that water uh, gets to the plant and makes those roots search down for it. So how we do it, you know, when we water it here, we'll water it, we'll do water something else, water it again, water something else, water it again. We'll do that four, five, six times. We'll dig down, you know, a few inches down. And just make sure that the water is kind of soaking down into the ground. Again, you want to encourage the roots to go down, not just simply out and stay kind of up. And then you shouldn't have to water it. I mean, to give you an idea, you know, the golden question is how often should I water? Usually I'm a little quicker uh, on the uptake and I mess with people. 
you take your your number of plants, you divide it by your garden square footage, you times it by the amount of shoes that you have in your garage, <laughs> and by that time they're like, ha-ha. So there's no real golden rule. There's no real rule in the sense of how often should I water. The better way I've found to explain it is to water it when the plant needs it, not when it's on the list of things to do. So just because the top is dry, you want to make sure it actually needs the water. The top dry is the first indication. The foliage bending over can be the first indication. That only makes you explore. I'm not going to use that one because that one's very, very dry to begin with. This is another one in the greenhouse. Most of the time that we spend in the greenhouse watering the plants is actually spent just looking. We very often spend most of the time actually looking at how dry that root ball is on the different plants, making sure it's not being fooled by just what's going on top. So the plant's upside down. This is dry up here, you know, usually, but then very quickly it turns to wet because the top is dry, more so the sun is beating on it, the wind is moving over it. But for it to dry out all the way down to the bottom, which is where the roots, you want to encourage the roots to go, really does take some time. So when we water these in in the greenhouse, we probably won't touch them for about another 10 days of, of nice sunny weather. Out in the garden, it's usually even longer. You plant in springtime, so once frost has passed, so mid-April, late April, I would even wait till early part of May. There's no problem waiting a couple of weeks because it gets the soil warm, not just about the air temperature at that point. You want the soil to be warm as well. So with that in mind, it's not just with the watering kind of what's going on on the top. You want to explore, see what's going on at the bottom. When you plant it at the beginning of May and you water it in really well, usually we get enough rain for May and June that you probably don't have to touch it again. It's more so July, August, where we get longer periods of dry with extreme heat. That's when you'd be watering. The plant is more stressed. The quickest way to kill them is to overwater. The plant will very, will very quickly perk back from being too dry. Then it will dry out from being too wet. So just bear in mind, just because the plant looks like it's in distress, it doesn't mean it is. I think if when I go out in the garden, I'm standing out there in 90 degrees for any length of time in the afternoon, I look like I'm in distress too, but it's not necessarily I need to rush inside. So with that in mind, just make sure you're looking at kind of the overall picture and not just being um, led by one of, the, one of the pieces of the puzzle. Obviously, too, you're looking at your daytime highs. You're looking at if you've got rain coming kind of thing. Again, the better, the better way to get into it is just to water it very thoroughly let it dry out, water it thoroughly, let it dry out. So. Water in the mornings, afternoons, evenings? Yep, so question was water in the morning, afternoon, evening, nighttime. Um, I'm not emphatic about it, but the, the lavender is very susceptible to leaf fungus. It doesn't get aphids. It doesn't get spider mites. It doesn't get white fly. Um, the one bug I've seen on it is a spittle bug. It looks like someone spat on your lavender, and it is moist kind of thing. I mean, it looks like there's bubbles on there. There's a bug in there. You can you can spray for that. I just kind of pick that out or smush it. Um, no raccoons, no squirrels, no anything. I mean, it's just it's one of the better plants because it's very it's very independent of being cared for. Um, but as far as when to water, because it's again, susceptible to leaf fungus, we do always do in the morning to let it dry out throughout the day. Um, when we get down to mulching, um, usually, yeah, the sand or the white rock mentioned there, we'll cover that now that the questions come up. When you've planted your lavender out there, you have a few options. You can leave the bare dirt because you don't have the mulch. You can put some white rocks or some gravel around there to pretty it up. And the, the rock, the sunlight hitting the rock, reflecting up under, again, will dry out that foliage on the underneath. So the sunlight dries out the top. The rocks will dry out the underneath. The plant, again, will be as dry as it possibly can with the foliage. 
Uh, the better thing or the best thing, sorry, to do would be oyster shells. Uh, so bring the oysters by here. I'll eat them. <laughs> you can keep the shells. Make sure they're ground up. You don't want whole shells harboring water, breaking down leaves and dirt and that kind of thing, touching your, fol uh, touching your foliage there. So ground up oyster shells around it. That will obviously line the soil as they break down and it will reflect the sunlight up under. Yes, ma'am. Would you recommend um, doing a layer of rock and then sand? On top? Uh, underneath. Underneath. Because when, when you're, you're trying to get that dryness. Would you do both? Yep. I'll answer that. So question was, when you're planting uh, sand, gravel, mix of the both to get it as dry as you possibly can, if you choose really fine gravel, I've heard that will hold the water and create like a false water table and keep that area kind of wet. Anything you amend with, whether it be the gravel, whether it be the sand, you want a nice big coarse grain. So you can, I would mix it all though, because the plant doesn't grow kind of in stages on the roots, like uh, lasagna gardening, I think is kind of a little confusing in the sense of your layer things. I wouldn't. I'm not led to do that with the with the plants because we get that question on the potting mix. You know, with the potting mix, can I use uh, rocks at the bottom and then the potting mix on top of that kind of thing? The potting mix what we have, what we use and what we sell is pretty expensive. In a regular size container, it's just easier to fill the whole thing with that potting mix because then it's uniform from top to bottom kind of thing. Um, gravel's a little cheaper though, sand's a little cheaper. So I don't think you're going to have a problem with that. I just don't know that I'd layer necessarily. I'd keep it all amended. Yeah. Uh, top to bottom. Um, so back to the oyster shells. So <clears throat> is any of that necessary? No, to answer the question. Um, what we have out in the field, we have not done anything but that weed fabric. There's no rocks over there because the rocks you've got to balance out, you know, um, to give you a, 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 a real life illustration, we had a bed that was mounded that we had rocks in and, you know, um, I don't want to blame the kids, but it was the kids <laughs> running through the, running through the bed like kids do. And the rocks would obviously go everywhere. Well, we took an afternoon, got some landscape timbers and added that. And it kind of finishes that area out and makes it nicer. Mm -hmm. So the, the rocks, the oyster shells, again, those are nicer for the plant to dry that out. But not like I would say, I'll do that because you're going to have 10 times the results. That's really not where it comes into. As long as when you water, you're just watering the dirt. You're not spraying all the foliage all the time. When this, when the, um, when it rains, there's obviously nothing you can do about that. So, the the, the drier that you keep the plant, the happier it's going to be. The rocks, the oyster shells are just nice touches if you want to, uh, because again, you only get benefit from that uh, from that investment. Spacing, so good air circulation is recommended. What that means is, because the plants are small not putting them this close so they fill in and make one plant prettier kind of thing and grow. Um, obviously, it's a little counterintuitive. Aren't you interested in selling plants? Yes, interested in selling plants that live for you, you get your return on investment and you're happy with. When you put the two together too close, at some point that foliage is going to grow together and then you're going to have the leaf-susceptible leaf susceptibility of the fungus and all that kind of stuff. So you space them apart. Even when they're full grown, you still don't want foliage touching. The blooms on the ends of the foliage can intertwine a little bit because they're only on there for about a month. But you don't ever want the foliage from one plant touching the other. So it begs the question, a 20 foot by 10 foot square, if you can imagine that, so 200 square feet, you've amended this area if you've amended, you've at least gotten rid of the weeds kind of thing, you've done some rows, you've spent your money on planting your plants, maybe you've done some rocks in there and maybe you haven't. At the end of the day, when you plant, let's say, eight of these little tiny plants in a 200 square foot area, you look at it and think, 
I don't think that was worth it. So what do I do in the meantime until these lavenders grow of size that it looks like it was worth it? You can put your annuals, grow your basil, grow some flowers, do some spinach in there, whatever you want to do in that space that you've amended, but you don't ever want that foliage touching your lavender foliage. You don't want your lavender plants too close where one's going to another. This is kind of where lavender splits off. Rosemary, it would be great if lavender grew like rosemary, but bloomed like lavender because rosemary is a lot more indestructible, but it doesn't bloom purple every year and smell like lavender. So it's not that lavender <clears throat> is hard to grow. It's just it's easier under the better conditions, kind of knowing that ahead of time versus kind of jamming them all together, being happy with it in the beginning, and then kind of picking which plant dies because you've got the leaf fungus spreading from one thing to another. So to give you an idea on what to do when you have, if you have problems, let's say. So one, type, uh, one time we had the lavender plant full grown and pieces of the foliage looked like they were wilting and then they would get really, really skinny, thin, the leaves would droop and it would die off. Not necessarily the whole plant, though some of them did that. There's a thousand different things those can be, but what we had was a, le a uh, root disease, and it was attacking the roots, making the plant look like it was dry so you'd water it, because as you watered it, it would speed up, that, speed up the death of the plant. You can get a liquid uh, that you um, drench into the soil, it never cures it, it just arrests it, and you have to reapply it every six weeks. And there's no way I'm doing that. So we just dug it up, let the soil lay fallow for a while, and then we've since replanted just to test it, and they did fine. So again, they come and go in that sense. Uh, that Again, the nice thing is you're not going to have all the bug problems that you do with other plants. Any of the problems that you have with it, mostly you can't control it if you've set it up in the beginning with uh, success in mind. So um, back to the spacing real quick before we finish up. Again, that airflow that you want around your plants, kind of when they're full grown, you still want airflow to take that moisture off um, <clears throat> of the foliage itself so it doesn't get anything on there. So if they're five and a half or five feet, so you do every two and a half feet? So what, what you're saying yeah, what we did over in the field, so on these hybrids, the French lavenders, we planted one and then six feet and planted another six one, feet. Okay. six feet and planted another one. Okay. If you're to do a zigzag row, you'll want three feet, uh, sorry, six feet kind of triangles. Okay. And then you kind of go along. When folks okay. ask about a hedge, yeah. you know, planting lavender as a hedge, we always recommend zigzagging. Because, again, you go back to on a good year, we'll lose 15%. So on a good year, you're still going to lose plants. On a bad year, it's going to look pretty rough. Mm -hmm. So if you zigzag, you're usually always looking at something right. kind of thing. It gives you a better chance. Whereas if you've just got a straight-up one-row hedge and one dies out, everyone goes, oh, look at that. It died. <laughs> so <clears throat> um, the, uh, the spacing is good kind of thing to make it to mix it up in the sense of you're not having you know all of it in one row kind of jammed up again uh sorry as you're only you're, you're uh only one deep obviously allows you no room for error whereas if you're zigzagging you've got a little bit more room for error there when is the best time to plant what time of the year ah uh, so best time of year to plant <clears throat> ideally it's actually fall but okay. Because retail drives the market, and we all want plants in spring. Spring is when you've got your biggest selection. Okay. The reason fall is because summer is the hardest season on these particular plants. Perennials, so trees, shrubs, grass, everyone's used to doing that in the fall. I mean, this is really, it, it's, it is an herb. You do use it culinary-wise, but this is really more so a perennial shrub. So, again, it goes back to that thinking of you put it in in the fall, it grows roots all fall long, it grows it grows roots into the winter, like well around Christmas, kind of slows down, 
Christmas, January, February. Perks back up as March rolls around and warms up. The silver foliage turns to green kind of thing as it wakes back up. Grows more roots, has more top foliage, explodes with growth April, May into June, blooms. You've got a much more established plant than you do starting with that heading into summer. Here's the difference, though. In spring, you easily get away with planting smaller plants. In the fall, the trials over the years that we've done, it's just we get much better results from planting like a one-gallon lavender than we ever do planting a four-inch. We have um, just a lot. It's uh, The results on those are skewed, I think, because the plant is much smaller when we plant it in the fall. So you do want a nice established size in the fall. We don't carry little four-inch pots anymore in the fall. We grow them through the summer, and we have those one gallons for you. Um, so with that in mind, planting now uh, – sorry, not planting now – Mid-April is last frost date, so April 15th in Virginia here is zone 7. Again, waiting until the 1st of May is really easier for you because you, we always get a cold night in the beginning of May almost every year. So um, to me, it's just not worth the risk for a couple of weeks. I'll let you know Sean take care of the lavender. I'll go back out the beginning of May. If anything, it's only going to be a bigger plant when you buy it anyway. And then plant that and have that, you know, grow from there. So with that in mind, May 1st is probably better. April 15th is kind of the cutoff. You can plant it after that, usually after frost is finished. But um, waiting until May is probably not going to hurt you at all. And then uh, any time from there all the way through the fall. When you're planting in the fall, you really want to get it in the ground by mid-September. You can plant into early or mid-October. It's just the longer you leave it, the less established that plant is going to be as winter rolls around. Uh, again, which is, for us, it's a harsh season. It's cold and all. But for the plants, as long as it goes into winter, stays in winter and comes out, they really don't care. It's when it gets that 70-degree day or 70-degree two days in February and then goes back to January weather or February weather kind of thing. It's up and down, up and down. That's where it hurts it, isn't it? I think I heard you mention it. So would you suggest or is it possible to even get it in spring, keep it in a pot? It seems like y'all do that here and then transfer it in the fall with, mm -hmm. with it being bigger and more established and it transfers fine. Yes. So question was getting the plant in the spring, keeping it in a container through the summer, planting it as a larger container in the fall. Yeah, so that's fine. To give you an idea, we grow, so we start out with a plant half this size in about two more weeks. So let's say uh, the beginning of April, we'll get that in. That will be ready in a one gallon size, grown in a greenhouse, probably about eight to 10 weeks later. It is a little different growing outside. Growing outside, it doesn't grow as quickly. So you would, so let's say you plant at the beginning of May, June, July, August, maybe the middle of August into a one or a two gallon size. It's rooted through all the way and ready to go in the ground. That would that would be fine, kind of thing. If you're going to do that, is it because of the convenience of a container that you want to do that? Is it because you get to control that container as opposed to planting it in the ground? Is it because in a container you get it closer to the house, which is more in your mind than wherever it is? So those kind of variables are going to determine whether you just go ahead and put it straight in the ground and be done with it, or you, like you said, you keep it in a container, you grow it larger to plant a larger plant kind of thing. We have like a pseudo one gallon that we have ready for the middle of May, which is probably three times the size of the root ball as this is. They're already up there and growing. So we do have slightly larger plants. It's just we don't have the space to grow a large one gallon in the greenhouse with the bench space. So we'll wait. We'll, we'll start them inside, and then when they're ready, we'll bring them out. Yeah. Okay, spacing pests. Deer don't like lavender. This is a really good one to cover because to sell 
lavender as a deer repellent, I, I'm not comfortable with. You plant lavender in front of your hostas, knowing you have deer that like hostas, right? So the lavender in front, to me, if I was a deer, I'd just step on your lavender <laughs> and eat your hostas, which would be like a giant slap in the face. So, um, yes, deer don't like it. It's, it's always the pungency. So deer don't like snacking on lavender. They don't like snacking on rosemary. It's because they're oily kind of plants. The thick, the foliage is thick. The, the stems are woody. It's just the pungency of the flavor that they don't like. They're going to eat a parsley or a basil a lot quicker than they would one of your woody perennials. So with that in mind, the deer don't like the lavender, but all things in balance. And really because they only get that two and a half feet kind of tall and four, three to four to five feet around, it's really not a huge hedge kind of thing. So, um, Propagation. So if anyone has tried lavender from seed, you most likely found out how hard growing lavender from seed is. Very, very poor germination rate and takes a long time to go from seed to sprout, from sprout to manageable plug, from plug to manageable growing plant. There's a lot of time in between that. Do not think of a basil. Do not think of a parsley where it pops in a week it's grown in three weeks. You're off and running with something a month later. Very, very, very slow growing. Uh, lavender is done from cuttings. So you would take a cutting. I'm not going to show that now because there's a little bit, it, you really need to see it close up. But the stem itself, you strip the leaves off uh, where, the, where the stem would go into the dirt and it grows you a new plant. And that's really how lavender is grown from one plant to the next. It's really done from a propagated cutting of one to the next to the next. Um, kind of involved, and that's really what you pay for. When you strip the leaves off, those node areas where the leaves were, because they were touching air or air was exposed to them, they've grown leaves. You strip those off and expose them to dirt, they're likely going to grow roots. Mm -hmm. But then obviously there's no roots, so you've got to encourage that and it takes some time. You've got to keep the soil moist but not wet and not dry out kind of thing. So if you have the time, it is a fun experiment. If you don't, the retail world has solved this problem for you and come up with garden centers. So come on out and grab some lavender. Um, pruning. We're going to kind of finish up with this one because this is – one of the more important things to remember that you want to do at least once a year and hopefully you'll be able to do it twice. So when you plant your plant, whether it be spring or fall, the next year, so next spring, it's going to grow nice and large for you and bloom. The bloom will be pretty for about three weeks. It will be okay for about five weeks and then it will turn ugly and you want to get the bloom out of the way of the plant so you can't have your cake and eat it too you either cut your lavender early to maintain the color so you have the blooms on there for maybe a week and then you'll cut them it is not going to rebloom that big heavy bloom like it does in spring again for you um, unfortunately, it's not a lavender vending machine. It really does that one big full-time bloom, usually around late May, early June. You prune that off if you want to keep it for your craft purposes, your drying purposes. You want to do a diffuser in the house without the electricity and the water. You just put some stems in a vase and you drop the oil on. That's, again, what throws the scent into the air. This bunch has very, very little scent, 300 pounds of foliage. Again, gives you the one pound of oil. So it's not about the bloom or necessarily the foliage of a plant. It's the collection of a lot of plants that give you that scent. So um, with that in mind, on the pruning side, you can either prune it off early to keep it for craft. You can leave it out there for a month for the bees and the butterflies and for your enjoyment, your neighbor's envy and that kind of thing. Um, but then they'll brown and they're 
they're not useless at that point. They've just lost their pungency. So they're not as good for culinary. They're not as pretty, you know, as a dried flower. Um, you can cheat and spray paint it purple. That way you get your best of both worlds. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, it's up to you when you prune it off. But at some point, if you leave it on there too long, it's going to get in the way of growing because you will see the stem has browned. The, gra the green has taken back off and is growing, and now the bloom is just in the way. So cut the bloom down to where the foliage kind of begins. And what I mean by that is out of this stem will come the bloom stem that reaches up from here, where that foliage starts and the stem uh, – sorry, where the – from the stem – let me figure out how to explain it first. Sorry, this is the camera thing. So where your stem gives way from leaves to bloom, that's where you want to cut. So just above that foliage, you'll see the bloom kind of sitting. You want to just lift that bloom off the plant. That's usually in early July. You're happy enough to cut it off if you've left it on there. Come the start of September – that's really when you're going to prune it. Lifting the bloom off is more so just tidying it up, getting the bloom out of the way. Your real pruning is the very beginning of September. So um, September long weekend at the start there, go ahead and prune up the lavender. Why you prune so early is the new foliage that comes out after you've pruned it gets accustomed to the cooling temperatures into winter. Don't wait till November, don't wait till December, don't wait till February. You prune it that start of September because if you prune it in, in December or uh, late November, you're opening that foliage up to freezing temperatures usually that night or the next night. You don't want to expose the plant to that kind of damage. So prune at the start of September. How much? The top third of the green foliage. You might want to write down it's the top third of the green foliage. Green, gray, greeny gray, grayy green, whatever you want to describe that color as. But as it's vibrantly growing, you'll notice it kind of greens up versus that silver color. So the top third of the green, why I phrase it like that is as the lavender gets really big, it becomes woody. It dies out in the center. It doesn't have all the foliage like it does when it's young like this in the center of the plant. It's got the nice tips. It's got a nice canopy, but it doesn't have all the foliage on the inside. You open the plant up and you look down and it's just those stems. There's no problem with any of that. That's what you want. You don't want your lavender really kind of leggy, and we'll cover that in just a second. So the top third of the green foliage, when it's young like this, you're going to be cutting quite a bit off a few stems. When the plant is full grown, you're going to be cutting a little bit off a lot of stems. And that's kind of how the transition goes. So again, top third of the green foliage, um, no measuring tape re required, just kind of gauge it. What I usually do on a full grown plant is kind of go through the middle, like a weird haircut, because that gives me my depth. And then I work from one side to the other. I found if I started on one side and worked the third to the other side, this side might be an eighth or a half. So I'd lose kind of my depth as I moved around. So you go through the middle, just a nice path through the middle, and then you cut either side of the third. So top third, it'll note on your handout a half. A half is fine. You don't want to be going more than that. A top third is a nice gauge because if you go a little bit more, then you're still good. You're still in safe territory there. The pruning. So one stem. Let's take this main stem here. This one stem. You've got a, little, a few little ones off to the side, and we'll cover that in just a little bit. One stem, when you cut it, turns into two. Those two stems turn into four. The four stems turn into eight. Yeah, there you go. Just making sure everyone's still awake. It's kind of cold out here. <laughs> um, so the, the, the pruning, you do not get the time back when the plant is young. The more often you prune it, the more branching you've got, 
So when the plant is full grown, it's not just working off a few stems that are supporting large amounts of the foliage that are catching your snow and your and your sleet and, and kind of splitting open. You want that nice shrub kind of look to it. You want that nice, well-kept, you know, I, I don't know everything, but I knew what I was doing with that kind of look to your lavender is what you're more so after. So um, with that in mind, that very first year, so if you do plant in spring, the more often, so once a month or once every other month, even as you plant it, you take this little plant, you cut the stems, they branch, a couple months later, come back, prune it again, a couple months later, prune it again. If you can do that and forego a little bit of bloom that first year, you're going to have a much healthier plant. You're going to have a much easier time of growing it, and it's going to reward you again with kind of a more, more, ch a more chance at longevity than it would have if, if you hadn't have pruned it. Um, and really can't stress the pruning enough, folks, too. So um, <clears throat> on the pruning side, it just allows that plant to kind of take care of itself because what's going to happen if you don't prune it, it's going to grow well, it's going to bloom, it's going to look good, but it'll grow that stem. That stem will get about 12 to 16 inches long, and then it will branch from that part of the stem. So if you can imagine another year after that, you've got this plant that's nice and big, but it's starting to show its weight and it's starting to lay open a little bit more. And again, that's what you don't want to be doing. Harvesting. Again, we've kind of covered the, you have your, your blooms out. Once the, so on the flowers, once they start to show purple, you can prune it as all of it shows purple. You can prune it a little earlier where the very tip of the bloom is still green. Once the purple appears on the, on the flower, the next step is a flower petal popping out of those buds. That's very pretty, but that's not what you want for craft purposes. On this one, you can see all those little gray kind of brown dots on there. That's the flowers that have dried. They don't drop off there naturally. You can pull them out if you want to, same as when they're over there and they're blooming. You can pull those out so you don't have those brown kind of dried up uh, dots on there, but just kind of time consuming. So, Any questions, folks? What is that lavender there? Right there, right by you, that's purple and oh. just a little top. Thank you. I thought I was going to have to tell you that's not lavender, that's a citrus tree. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Save me, thank you. Okay, so thank you for asking too because I wouldn't have covered it. So this is an annual. This is a fern leaf lavender, hence the, the fern leaf name with the fernier kind of foliage here. This is not lavender in the sense of the bloom or the smell. It's just the color. If you grow annual flowers, this la the fern leaf lavender is a workhorse. I mean, you're just not going to find a better flower. But as far as a lavender, if you're after, I want the lavender smell, I want to dry the bloom for craft, this is not the lavender for you. This one here, the foliage, so it's an annual. Anything below about 42 to 43 degrees is going to start to kill this off. So you plant it early May. You'll have it all the way into kind of early October. The, the size of the, of the foliage will quadruple to quintuple, gets a really nice kind of 12 to 16 inches around on the foliage. And these blooms, it just shoots these up all through the season. And the more often you deadhead, now to deadhead it, you're going to take it all the way down to the foliage and kind of break it off. The more often you deadhead it, again, you're getting that old bloom out of the way and allowing the plant to produce more. They still like the same type of um, soil? It'll, um, so it's more of a flower on the growing conditions. Still likes to dry out. It'll take a heavier soil, more so a container kind of plant. Mm -hmm. Even in the ground is fine. But um, in the ground and in a container, you're going to have to water it more often, still letting it dry out, but um, uh, making sure that if you don't water it, this one in particular, you won't get as many flowers. So that's really the, the only thing. Mm. 
Any other questions? Um, seems like they don't really need companion plants, you know, like some love to be together, tomatoes, basil, and stuff like that. Are they fine by themselves as well as are they, and are they okay with different different types, different species also? Or do they like to be together in pairs of the same type? Or So no, no, no concern about any of that. They'll do, by, like, uh, so we often get the question, you know, I want a lavender area. Should I do all the same? Should I mix it up? And that's that's more so a, just a personal touch. Uh, once you've figured out if you want English versus French and you don't have to separate the two, uh, on a bank or in a garden, even if it's flat, you might have English at the front and the French at the back because the French will get bigger. They bloom a little bit later as well. Um, as far as the, the, the what's best for you, that's personal. The difference, though, is the colors. So the head coat's that deep, dark purple. The grosso is kind of between that really deep, dark purple and that true light lavender purple. Then you can have the Provence, which is that true lavender light purple color. We have white Provence, which I know sounds goofy because it's why would you want a lavender that's white? But it actually looks very pretty because it looks just like a lavender, <clears throat> smells it, and the bloom is white. So it's fairly unusual. Um, what else? You've got the, the Spanish, which is a much lower kind of shrub. The Spanish, the Stocius, is a tender perennial. So it's not a given that it's a, as hardy as the other ones. Um, so now again on the on the um, on the differences between the two, it's more so, you know, if you want blooms from late May all the way through June, you would do a mix of the English and the French. If you wanted it all uniform, you'd obviously just pick the one. You know, that you were and interested. it is fine by itself too. Yeah. Now by by itself, do you mean? Um, well, I guess, how do you mean by itself? Um, I guess, well, just just one plant. I know some plants oh. like to have yeah. you nope. know, more than one, but if it's in a pot by itself or just planted by itself somewhere. Yep. No, so the question was, is lavender okay just one by itself? Yes. Yep. There's no dependence on growth or pollination or anything like that. Yep, for sure. One more thing. Mm -hmm. um, talking about the spacing, knowing that it does not like to be fertilized, I thought it was interesting when you said at first, because they are so small, they're so spaced out, you can fill it in like with your veggies and whatnot. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you are feeding those yep, types of plants a lot and you're watering them a lot. So wouldn't that a lot of those nutrients leach out to the lavender that you would not want them having? Yep, good question. So question was... On the planting of the lavender, to have it spaced out correctly, and then to fill in with other plants around, what about the fertilizer? Lavender doesn't like fertilizer. Other plants that are planted around might like fertilizer, so what to do with that? Um, so on a bed, like a traditional raised bed that you're going to do all your vegetables in, you're going to feed the whole thing left to right, front to back, all of it, and amend that in. <clears throat> if you've planted vegetables around your lavender kind of thing, you're really just going to specifically feed that vegetable. You don't ever want to put fertilizer around the trunk of the plant up against the trunk. You right. only want it on the soil and you can judge kind of the canopy size. to that's where you feed to when you water, just be sure that when you water, you're not holding the water there and making that fertilizer move from one to the other. You water it, get the fertilizer wet, water it, and then it'll soak into that area. Um, now, as you're – so the other kind of question – the other uh, good part to your question was, you know, you're probably not going to put a tomato in between your lavender because of the shading. So you're going to do like a spinach or a lettuce or a flower or something like that, and you can liquid feed those as well. Um, <clears throat> that second year, you're really yeah. probably not going to do a whole lot. You might fill in with a few little – with kind of ground color, uh, carpet flowers, but you're going to be happier with the size that they are because that, that plant, you know, goes from this to kind of a nice kind of one foot kind of ball. And then once the blooms are on there, that'll kind of spread out to two feet. So it'll kind of fill in that area pretty nicely. Right, thank you. Yep, you're welcome. 
how do these plants do as far as relocating? Oh, good question, Bill. Um, so Bill's question <clears throat> was, how do these plants do as far as relocating? And I'm very glad you asked, Bill, because I probably wouldn't have covered it. They do not like to be transplanted at all. Now, with that in mind, if you know that to begin with, then you haven't got anything to lose. So if you've really put it in the wrong spot and it's gotten too big and I need to take it from here and put it over there, um, you know, is it okay to do that? And it's like, well, as long as you know it's probably not going to live, by all means have at it and you can only get a better result than the dying. Um, when you relocate them, they usually have a better chance if when you dig them up, you put them in a container that's very specific to that size of root ball that you've been able to dig up. Get a bit of potting mix in there, treat it like a container plant, reestablish it in that container as its own plant, and then go ahead and plant it. That's going to give you kind of the best chance. I don't know why. Uh, I just don't know if it's just that tender on the roots anytime you disturb any of it, but we've almost never had I can't remember one that we've moved successfully. So once you, that was why we kind of stressed on the spacing. You really don't want to be kind of cheating in the beginning because you're probably only going to have to pick which one lives and which one has to go. Yeah. Um, as far as relocating, digging them up. Uh, just get as much root ball as you can too when you're digging it up. Soil is surprisingly heavy. When you dig a ball that's a, like a foot and by a foot, it's pretty heavy by that point. So, uh, will lavender thrive as a container plant? So, Sarah's question was Will lavender thrive as a container plant? As long as you keep ahead that it doesn't get root bound, as long as it's in well drained potting mix that's light and fluffy and dries out, lavender is going to do fine. It's just make sure you pick a variety that will stay smaller so that you don't have to step it up as often. You know, from this four inch to a six or an eight inch isn't really a big deal to pop it out and re, uh, repot, uh, repot it, sorry. But once you start getting to that 10 and 12 inch size, that's quite a bit of soil and plant to be messing with. Um, once you hit that eight inch mark, you might just step it to a uh, 14 inch at that point, knowing this is how often I need to water it kind of thing. Um, but you probably want to choose one that's just suited to a, uh, to a smaller kind of maturity size. So the elegance pink, the elegance purple, uh, there's another one out there called mini blue, and that's more of a bush style lavender. So those would be the preferred varieties for that. Uh, what is the lifespan of the plant in ideal conditions? Thank you, Debbie. So another good question. Under ideal circumstances, not in Virginia, indefinitely. <laughs> in Virginia, under ideal circumstances, anywhere from three to eight years. So that's kind of one of the drawbacks to bear in mind. Even if I do all this work, I still only might have it until it reaches full maturity and then it might die out or it might last longer. So unfortunately, you know, lavender, these are the things that we talk through to kind of get you uh, in the right direction in the sense of giving it the best opportunity. But real world, uh, to give you an example, we have husbands come out because they ran over the lawn, uh, ran over the lavender with the lawnmower and killed it. We have husbands and wives come out, share an ice cream, because once he ran over the lavender <laughs> with the lawnmower, it's never looked better. Yeah. So, again, that's why I mentioned at the start, these are the ideals. What you end up with can vary one to another, but pretty much they ring they ring pretty true kind of one to the other. It's just uh, that was the other thing, too, to Bill's question <clears throat> um, that I forgot to mention. On the pruning side, you know, when you transplant the plant, how does it transplant? Well, usually it doesn't, but sometimes it will. On the pruning side, we get the questions to my lavender is two or three years old. It's leggy. It looks kind of ugly. Uh, how, I've never pruned it. What do I do to make it not look so ugly? Um, you can prune it as much as you want. If you look at that and that thing looks horrible and everyone tells you it looks horrible, then you can prune it to whatever size you want, knowing that what you're doing is not ideal 
maybe when you prune it, like the lawnmower running over kind of thing, the thing perks back up and looks fantastic. We've done that quite a bit with the rosemary more than we have the lavender. The lavender we really try to keep on, whereas rosemary sometimes gets out of hand. Real big, ugly looking rosemary kind of thing that the tips are nice, but the foliage is all defoliated, just looks rough. We'll cut that thing right back kind of just to a small ball. It usually takes a couple months to recover, but mo more so often it does recover versus the lavender that doesn't. So again, with that in mind, you know, it's again those, well, how do I make the best of the situation that I have? If you know you're happy with, I know next time I prune it early, then go ahead and cut it down to wherever it needs to be and see if it regrows. Um, Bill, going back to relocating, since it's not really recommended, would or could you use it for cuttings? Yes, uh, you can use it for cuttings. So if, before relocating a lavender, if it's going to die off and you want to start a new one, you don't want blooms on there. You've got to kind of think like the plant is thinking in the sense of in spring, its goal is to bloom. Whereas once the bloom is spent, it will grow through the summer and kind of perk back up and look happier for the fall. That's the time to take your cuttings. Unfortunately, the fall gives way to winter. So very little sunlight to manage your little cuttings. So uh, you can do the cuttings in the early spring. But if you wait until early to mid-April, usually it has already set the bloom down in the stem. So if you're cutting it off for cuttings late April, you're likely cutting the bloom off. So that's kind of the catch there. And I think that's it so far as questions. Um, I think at this point we're done, folks. If you want to finish up, I will stick around, though. And, I mean, this is not so much more about me talking than you getting your questions answered. So if you have questions, stick around. Those folks online, if you have questions, too, stick around. Other than that, I think we're done. Enjoy your day. Thanks for tuning in. Look forward to seeing you at the farm when things are the right way to come out, yeah. be amongst everyone. I know, so Thank you so much. No problem. Yeah. 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 So happy. I I doing doing everything wrong. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that explains all my troubles. Yeah. Um, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. I'm snitching my face with this. I'm just gonna sneak into my. Good hat. idea. <laughs> Why are you gonna? You gonna? There's like makeup in the in the cap and. Okay. That yeah. little thing out at the front. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Ask about the owls. Let's see. The owl. The other two didn't Yes. Go what is that? Just a decoration, or does it move with the wind, or what? Yeah, so it actually moves back and forth and mm -hmm. it flaps its wings. That's so cool. Uh, <laughs> that is just. I know. Uh, All right. I saw it and I was like, I have to have that. It. But it's for sale. Yes. Oh. We've got a few of them. You do? Wow. Oh. No problem. Oh, I need to pay you. Oh, yeah. Just Joey will take care of you in the store. Thank you. Joey will. I'll I'll go up with him and get, oh, okay. and get you straight. Yeah. Okay.